Hey, everybody. My name is Justin Bordeaux, and this is Performance Branding Masterclass. Now, I've debated for a long time if I'm actually going to release this out to the general public. I've been doing brand strategy for well over 23 years now, and I've helped organizations from the West Coast to the East Coast and even international brands build more brand power. More so, I've worked directly one-on-one -on -one with the executive staff, if not the actual CEO and entrepreneurs themselves, to take ideas from concept to shelf, no matter what it is, whatever next level you're trying to get to, my objective here is to give you as much value as possible. So I'm going to give you a behind the scenes, never before seen secrets of what I use to help navigate beyond just typical brand strategy. So I'm going to go into a deep dive, give you guys a high level on my personal brand strategy course. We're going to go into performance branding. And I'm going to go ahead and let you guys know what that is as well, because it's a whole different thing and it's taking things to that next level. I want to dial it up to number 11 here for you guys and give you as much value as possible. Now, it's taken me some time to actually go through this entire coursework. And so this might actually get split into two. So if everything does well on version one, part one, I'm going to go ahead and, and continue on and give you guys version two. Now, I'm going to go ahead and release this for free because I want you guys to have as much value to understand how you can really leverage your brand, your business, and even your personal brand, which is actually key, fundamental to take it to that number 11 spot. So like I said, I've been doing this a very long time and I look forward to actually coming out from behind the shadows and give it to you guys here in the first time ever, putting out my own brand and let's, let's go ahead and create something that's truly bespoke. I really, really, really want you guys to find this, this other thing about yourself. So not wasting any more time, let's go ahead and get into this. I'll share more about my story as we go through here, riddle it in there with, with a lot of the storytelling that I'm gonna go ahead and do here today. But go ahead, save this link, get out, grab a pen, paper, everything. You're gonna need it, so let's go. All right, so let's get into performance branding. What is performance branding? Really, the concept here came to the point where out of the 23 years I've been doing business and actually working, consulting with different brands across different industries from video games to magazines to fashion to working directly uh, as an agency and with other agencies, one thing was really getting to me to really figure out what was so much more important to really move the needle in any business. And that came down to one thing. It came down to the leadership and how do we actually take something from the regular brand to the marketing and really dial it into number 11. And the goal here was always to get something to the next level, always put it to the next level. So as we dive into this, let me go ahead and give you guys a little bit more of a background about myself. So I've been in the industry, like I said, 23 years now. And what I do is I work directly one-on-one -on -one with entrepreneurs, executives, CEOs, anyone who's looking to get the most out of themselves. Now, my mentor said to me, he says, just live life by your eulogy. What do you want people to say about you when it comes your time? Do you want a crowd of people outside saying that you've helped change them, you've helped move them through their life cycles and help them with their business, their life, whatever it was? Or do you want to be known for all the cars you want to buy? Probably both for, for my sake. But you know, the other things that I do is that I'm an old school B-boy. In the 90s, I actually was, uh, I had my own crew. I used to break here in uh, Jacksonville, Duval West Side. I grew up on 103rd. And now I'm actually a partner in an organization called the Cypher Experience. And I work with my business partners over there to help build culture, something so much more profound. We took what we loved and Ronnie had this vision and he told it to me and I says, look, let's go, let's make this happen because it was something that would just, we're able to help people find some, some direction in their life. And really that brand for me is developing a culture based upon the underground world that I grew up into that helped me become who I am today. And so you guys can find me around a cipher as B-Boy Ghost. And then if I'm not there, you can see me running other businesses, follow me on social media. I love to engage and interact with everybody. But the other things that I'm doing is uh, I am a full-time consultant. I contract with agencies to uh, help them build brand strategy for their clients as well. I'm also the chief branding officer and partner at a, at a, a company called Pivot Consumer Technologies. They actually also own the Sun Brand exhibit 
and uh, their SaaS company. We'll, we'll get more into that later, but I've been doing this a long time. My background came from really running on the streets and doing graffiti and being a b-boy and always loving art and trying to figure out what more can I do? How can I really take this and, and create something out of it? And I know that things are possible. My biggest thing here is taking two things that I, I love that I'm good at, and that's really design and creating and reverse engineering and solving complex problems. And that's what really at the end of the day is what we're able to do with real hard strategy work. And then I took the other thing I love to do, and that's help people break through the next level. I, my thing is I want to convince you to believe in yourself, convince you to break your barriers, break all those things that came down, because I've actually faced a lot of turmoil in my life, but I don't use it as an excuse. And I want to take that and all those lessons that I've learned and empower you to take your business, your life to the next level. And that's kind of an idea of, of what you can expect from me. And I want the best for you. That really comes down to it. And as we go through this deck, I'm going to take everything I can and really walk you through level one here. And that's the foundation. And like I said, this entire coursework is actually really geared towards a high level brand strategy, performance branding, leadership development, mindset coaching for a personal brand and how that affects the entire brand. So we're going to go over the foundations today. And there's a lot to cover there as well. But just an insight as to what this brand is and what I'm doing as, as a consultant is I help find out what the old you is. We break down, we get rid of it, and we do a complete identity shift, and we dial in to find out who the real you is, not the new you. There is no new you. There's the real you that's underneath the surface that's keeping you from getting to the life you want. You know, let's say that you have all the time and money in the world. Great, fantastic. I'm not here to show you that then. I'm here to show you to get to the next level, whatever that looks like for you. Is that looking like you want to build your legacy? Well, let's build your legacy then. Let's figure out what to do. And then what we do is we take all the components about you and we inject that into a, a full-on brand strategy. And then from there, we figure out how to go to market, what we need to market, what your model looks like, what your business model looks like as a thought leader, or what it looks like your impact within the community and your business and so forth. And then after that, I walk you through how to manage the growth, brand management, personal brand management at that. And this is the entire framework course, but I'm going to go ahead and walk you guys through a level one here, which is the foundation. So performance branding, like I said, it is dialing in. It, the goal here is to get you to level 11. Forget 9, 10. It's to push you beyond the realm of where you think it's possible, but where you have always objectively wanted to go. And so we've taken personal brand strategy and mindset development, and we put it into one because if you're going to push the envelope, you're going to really push your business. It comes down to pushing yourself to lead, to grow, to have an identity shift, to step into the person that really is required to get you to that next level. And the way that performance branding fits in is that it is above brand strategy and marketing. You've got, you've got full service agencies. They do brand strategy work, and they usually work with the company and all, all those components. And then you have marketing. Marketing agencies are not always equipped to actually handle full-on brand. And this is where we see a lot of gaps in the industry. And I'll cover more of that here soon because we're going to break down the entire brand ecosystem. And I have a graphic for you guys to look at there. And at the bottom of this, you got freelancers. you got people you call in that come in, they do the job, they get it done, the tacticianers, and that's that's what they do. And they have their place. And the idea here is that a lot of times, a lot of CEOs, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of executives get stuck in this space of doing rather than leading. And the objective here is to get you to break that those habits and get you to really perform to really make a difference. So where I start, I usually start out with a discovery review. And that is, as mentioned, bespoke. It's really figuring out more about what you're about and diving in because the goal here is to find out what business are you really in? What are you really looking to do? And the objective here is to find a way to make sure that we discover what is absolutely clear. Clarity is key across the board. And clarity is key across what you do in your personal life, but what you also do as a business. And you need to set clear intentions. I'm not talking about goal setting. I'm not talking specifically about goal setting. Yes, we need to know where are you going 10 years down the road? What, what does that look like for you? What's your exit strategy? And at the end of the day, 
objectively, I want you guys to feel alive doing what you do because it's it gets to a certain point to where you feel stuck. You feel like you're swimming up up the current and against all the waves are crashing against you and you just are suffocating and you have no time for your life. You have no time for your kids. You have no time for anything. And you feel in some instances that you're lost. And the objective here is to what makes you feel alive? Why did you start doing it in the first place? And a lot of times we can get caught up in the processes of, of operating the business. But we forgot why we do it. And when we find out why we're here, what we're really doing, because the key is to make sure that we're hyper-focused in some areas that really align with what you do, because you do your best work when you're loving what you're doing. And like I said, it's really figuring out 10 years down the road, what are we trying to accomplish? What's in front of us right now is important, but for us to really figure out what we need to do today, we need to figure out what's happening down the road. So what's your exit strategy? Are you looking to sell for top tier? Do you want to keep it in the family? Do you want to build brand power? Do you want to go into mergers and acquisitions? Do you want to scale your business? This is key. It's important to be able to answer at least one of these key components here. And what is top tier? Top tier, you want to sell the business for $30 million, but your brand currently is really only worth 10. So we have to start digging in and finding out. So if I called a business broker and he said, just, I have this client, they actually want to sell. I think they need some work. I think they need some retooling. What do we need to do? Now, in this instance here, I probably wouldn't really work too much on the brand leadership of that uh, thought leader, of that entrepreneur, all that much. Because if we're looking just to sell the business, another question is, where are we at? Where are we really at? Because what's going to get us there is really figuring out what are the blockers. And three common blockers is not working on the business is that they become comfortable and everything is just status quo and they never really pushed. It's very different because when someone wants to buy your business, they're looking to buy it because they want the, the customer base that you have, or they're looking to buy the process that you have. If they're looking to buy the process and the process is broken, uh, you're not going to get top dollar out of it. They want to see how those are fixed because if you have those things running efficiently, you're going to sell for more money because that's less work that your buyer has to do. But if they only want your, your demographics, well, then there's a different approach that we have to take to that. The other thing that's keeping companies from actually being able to sell as they're comfortable is that they've made, they've made it so they've romanticized it. They've made it their baby. It's not your baby. It's your business. It's so important to fall in love with different components of what the business does and so one problem that I've seen and why personal brand development and performance branding is important is because there's so many people that have their identities wrapped up way too much into their business. And when they retire, when they sell the business, now what? Now what are they going to do? And it's tough for them because they want to sell for $30 million and they 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 were only offered $10 million and they hold on too long and then boom, business closes and you're done. And a competitor comes in, buys you for pennies on the dollar. Being too emotional about the process is really going to get in the way. And This is the thing with the personal branding is we break down those barriers and we rework it from a way that actually makes sense for the business. And the other thing is you're too late to act. Maybe, maybe the time now is that you want to sell next year and there's too much to do, which is why we need to start planning now what your exit strategy is, because let's just painting a, a very realistic scenario as a hypothetical. Let's say that you want to sell in five years. You're ready to go, but the doctor comes back and says, hey, you know what? Uh, there are some issues, and we believe that you need to start figuring out how you want to live the rest of your life, and you got six months. What are you going to do? And so it's that sheer moment of panic. It's always being prepared for what happens and leaving the business and everything else in a better place. And in that moment, how are you going to live your life by your eulogy? See how it all comes around? It's to really figure out what are we doing from a personal standpoint and also the business if you want to sell for top tier. Now, if you want to keep it in the family, just as a quick kind of SWOT analysis here, not, not really, but in some ways, keeping it in the family, you want to hand it down to junior or whoever in the organization. And the question I have here is how are your customers going to receive the news? Are they going to be excited that you're retiring? Because- Let's paint the picture here is that, hey, you know what? I only did business with your father. I only want to do business with him. I like how he does business. 
And so he has his own personal brand at that moment. He, she, whatever. We're not going to talk genders. I'm talking business. And when we talk about the customers receiving the news, it's making sure that they either, one, don't even realize what happened. Or two, if it is that kind of business where that relationship is built, it's time to start building relationships and working on that personal brand that of the new leadership that's coming in. Because when it comes time to make that switch, what do the operations look like? What are the what does the brand experience look like now with that with the the handing over to keep it in the family? And I love family businesses, especially ones that have gone two, three generations, because there's opportunity there. Because as time has progressed and as industries change and markets change, there's opportunity for growth with new ways of thinking, new solutions. And it's important to have a brand strategy in place and retool. Moving into that phase, if you're going to hand it over, how are we going to handle the transition? What does a new vision look like? You can still share the same values from, from the generations before, but how do we amplify that and make it even bigger if that's the goal here? And the last thing here is building brand power. Two reasons you build brand power. One, to buy everybody else as a scale up. That's kind of a, a two sub of that one, but you either buy or get bought. Building brand power. It allows you to, to scale the business if you want to open more locations, if that's your goal. But it also allows you to position yourself for acquisitions. If you want to actually end up buying someone who's top tier and they're looking to sell, now you're in a position to actually have more insight because you've led the industry. And the way to, to get this done is, you know, when you are looking to buy a business, you're buying revenue, you know, and what you're looking for is that unique value. What unique value do you have? that keeps you from getting bought out. Or if you want to build brand power to scale, to grow, and then eventually your exit strategy is not really to, to acquire other businesses, but to put yourself in a path to be bought. There's different ways we can go with this. The variables are, they skew. But in this aspect here, especially if you are, if you are in this case, a thought leader, you're selling solutions, you're not selling services. And when we talk about business, we talk about the brand ecosystem, even in this is that when we want to really connect with our customers, it's not about the service that we're selling. It's about the solution that we're actually giving them. Whatever business you're in, on layer one, problem layer one makes you exactly the same as the business that you're the competitor with, or makes you a, a standout different, which makes you be that person that they want to go to is you're selling them something deeper. You're selling them some sort of solution that they can't get anywhere else. And the only way to do this is raise your standards, is really figure out who you are, what you're about personally, creating new value points for yourself, but also new value points for the business. And as we as we figure out where our strategy is, where we want to go as an exit strategy, now we get into the foundation, the fundamentals. So if you were to call me and say, Just, I got this. This is where I want to go. This is what I want to do. I said, fantastic. Let's get it done. And so now we've got to, I'm not going to use the word audit. Let's use the word review. I like the word review because we get to discover a little bit more. And what we're going to discover here is we're going to figure out how the foundational points are in an entire system because we're going to break down the brand ecosystem on how each one of those are affected by the brand and every single person in the organization affects the brand. We're going to talk about the three brand types and the three ad types and how to leverage all of them. And going 10,000 feet, it all ties together. Pulling it back. So many times we get caught in the little silos of what we're doing. And that might look like you have hired a marketing agency, but they're trying to update your website and they have no experience there. I have a recent experience with that with a, a previous client of mine. They called me to situate some things, and that was the issue. The client or the the client's website went down, and that, that really, really every minute down was tens of thousands of dollars for them. So let's talk about the brand ecosystem. Performance branding is it's I wouldn't really call it business consulting because it's so much more than that. As a business as a business consultant comes in, they're gonna take different key elements of this, but they're not looking at the entire ecosystem on how it works at the end of the day to build brand equity. And that's my goal here is to how do we position you as a, as a leader of your own brand, 
of yourself or what you're doing, if they, you're one-on-one -on -one or the business that you're running, it all plays into effect here. So the ecosystem here involves business, the finance division, operations, brand strategy, culture, marketing, sales, and impact. Business is included in your leadership, really knowing yourself, knowing your buyer. Finance is, we're going to figure out how to actually allocate the funds to help build your brand. And I'm not talking about all the little tiny nuances. We're going to talk about some key specifics here. Operations is the little thing. And I'm going to keep HR out of operations and culture. I'm going to move that over to leadership because it, HR is really kind of one-sided. They're looking out for the business. So the brand strategy is the operating Bible of how everything should interact and how everyone in the organization should act and communicate across the board with every single silo. You might think this is part of operations, but operations, yes, they're there to make things run smooth, but brand strategy is driving it a little bit further. It's making sure everything runs smooth via operations, but what emotion are we now channeling and triggering with the people that we're going after? Our culture inside and outside, and culture is a big thing here. And it's important to build on values so we they become the brand ambassadors. And then we're going to talk about marketing and sales. There's two conversion points here. So many organizations and, and leaders get caught up in conversion point one, marketing, and they think that's it. We have another one, conversion point two. And in the middle of that, we've got a go silo. We got, we got this little silo in between where communication really is tough. Communication silos and the, the issue with communication within silos is, is nothing new, but it's important to mention. And then sales, conversion point number two, where so much more happens than people realize. And I understand people have this angst against sales, but it's so valuable and important for the organization on levels you can't even begin to understand. And impact is so important here. And I've got some case studies on this one here to reference back as far as the data points and not getting caught up into it, but understanding where we're at because as we move through this, this entire thing is constantly fluid. It's moving just like your own growth. What we're looking to do here is play the infinite game. The infinite game is to keep this moving and always keep advancing and growing. And there's never a point to where yeah, at the end of the year, financially, we've been able to say that, hey, our, our revenue stream is this, our gross and our net is this, and we profited this. Fantastic. We That's important, but it's also important to continue to grow because as we build more brand equity, we can sell the company for more money. And then you also sell your value as it increases. You raise your rates and you're able to do more with your customers, for your customers. So business, know who you are, what you do why you do it, and what you stand for. It's so important to have clarity in this aspect. And when we're looking at the buyer persona, and it's important to really have clarity here, the business and brand, how it actually interjects. A lot of times when working with brand strategy, a lot of businesses have failed in this one area, and that's really understanding their buyer persona what the what business they're really in, what problems they're really solving, and really having the pricing model. Buyer persona a lot of times gets in, in integrated with the brand strategy because the buyer persona wasn't created. So more market research has to be done. And that's that's okay. But when you're starting out, it's good to make sure that you, the leadership, you the owner, you the thought leader, really knows your buyer and what you're looking to to do here and understanding why you're in business what is it you're really solving and not solving 15 different problems but pick three core elements here and also the pricing model is a huge thing too because when our pricing model is off we're losing money and there's also a brand finance formula that i'm going to break it down for you on where you really need to be allocating to grow because the cost of bad brand business is your dil your diluted focus is costing you buyers because if you have too many buyers and you say hey you know what we got five buyers we're going after and we're gonna spend targeting dollars on every one of those buyers but really you have two buyers three buyers are really not your buyers they don't really truly align you're spending more time and energy there so that's three buyers you're wasting energy 
focus and money on. And like I said, wasted energy is money based upon the per hour of the person using that energy, whether it being the amount of time that you get charged per hour by your marketing agency or what have you, or someone in-house trying to develop this or the time that you've lost that could actually be gained for something else. And then when we focus too much on the competition as a business, we've lost sight of who we are because not everybody's competition. When we focus too much on the competition, we forget to set a standard on what we're doing and why we're different. Because uh, I remember Christian Abrahamson, he's a, a sales coach, a sales consultant. He's amazing. He said, the one unique thing about you, about your business is you. And he was absolutely right. And the most unique thing that you can do is find out what you do great as a business, what you do great as an individual, and also the bad pricing models. Bad pricing models cost organizations 5 to 10% every uh, of the entire revenue every single year. So how do we find X? What's the variable that we're looking for here? We need to be absolutely clear across the board, have clarity, because when we're clear, when our vision is clear, then everything that we do in the organization is clear. And we're able to hyper-focus, we're able to save money in other areas and put them to places that actually make us more money. And it's also setting aside a time to work on the business and making sure that you're always growing in some capacity there. And this is not rocket science. I know a lot of you listening to this know that this is it. And there's a time tactic that I shared today on LinkedIn that talks about how it's important to work on your business. But it's also scheduling yourself in a way that you work four days, make those the most effective effective days as possible and spend one day a week always finding another solution. Where can we go? How did the week go? Where can we improve the process during the week? And it takes you as a business, as a as a person, as a leader to dial in a little bit more about that. And you got to live the brand. You really have to embody everything that you're about and pushing that fact that you are the expert in the industry. That is what you do. This is who you are and this is what you stand for. And our objective here is to build trust. And I'm moving this into the next slide here, but the thing is also we need to stay flexible. As I mentioned before, is that when when we romanticize the business and we are stuck on this dream, we're stuck on this idea, your idea is just an idea. It does not mean it's going to work. And that's where a lot of people fail is that they get stuck on the idea, but they never implement it. When they don't implement it, then it they never have a chance to try it, fail it, improve it, and, and so forth. But then we go into leadership. What's really going to take this whole thing to the next level? Because leadership, according to Gallup, you're losing, organizations are losing billions. But the question is, how much are you losing because of poor leadership? And leadership is in two capacities here. Leading your own life, getting out of your own way, not putting blockers in for you to take the lead, be the hero of your own story. But also, how much is it costing your business because of over-controlling, oversight, micromanagement, and things like that? Like, And the the leadership really plays a toll on, on your entire culture. So what matters in leadership from a brand perspective? Communication. It's key because we need to be able to communicate for our vision. HR, I've included here in leadership because it's so important to have the right people HR department is one-sided. HR is, is a hold of everything. Hiring is looking and understanding who's going to be the best for your business, who's going to be the best for your right hand, who's going to champion you, your brand, everything. And then leadership is so important as far as building culture because leadership servitude. It's how are you serving? How are you making the job easier for everybody else? It's not to make the job more complicated. The goal here is to make the job easier for everybody else. And your personal brand is your reputation. And reputation is, is massive. And personal brand development, personal brand management is the intentional work put into building your reputation to build trust. And that is putting time into building trust with your, your team, with the community, with your clients. It's really fostering those relationships because it's different from when you lead as a brand. When you lead as a brand, you are setting a standard in the industry of what your company, what your organization has on its own. And so it's it's divergent in making sure that 
you've separated yourself. You have your own personal brand, which is how people think about you versus how they think about your company. Because you are not your company. And so many times, a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs will inject the, their own personality into the brand and into the business. And that's okay to a certain extent, but you're a human being. And we need to pull out what really makes you fun and what, what things you enjoy. And that really comes down to, when it comes down to leadership in, in any sort of capacity, authenticity is key here. Authenticity will win you stronger business, stronger clients than trying to entertain the ones that really are costing you your own sanity, your team sanity, costing you more money to fix fires. Because poor leadership really, and when it comes to your brand, can cost your business quite a bit. Your attrition rate, training costs, hiring the wrong people, you know, and those people resemble represent the brand as well. And especially if they're out there in the forefront representing what you do, there's emotional risk. And what I mean by emotional risk is that the morality of the organization, of the culture, really is looking to you as the beacon, as the example to set the tone of how, how the day should be, how the week should be. And looking at perspective in a practical manner, but then when we are not leading as a or as an organization or as an individual, we become then invisible. And how does that affect your your wallet? How does that affect your business? Is that you lose out on bid opportunities, you lose out on the sale, because if a new business comes to town and they don't know about you and and they don't know everything about you and and you haven't been noisy enough to say, hey, we're confident this is what we do. There's small firms out there with five people handling multi million dollar accounts here locally in Jacksonville. And there's organizations that are missing out on opportunities because they're invisible. And then the other cost for leadership is innovation. There's overlap here from innovation to other areas, but really here it's that when you're leading, that leadership and that pushing and that going with the flow and creating an environment, environment's huge in leadership and culture, and innovation keeps you from gaining more market share from creating new things and poor leadership also when it comes down to leadership and when i one one thing i'm going to do i'm going to stop here really quick because referencing back to the entire brand ecosystem they're all interjected so you will see overlap because what you do in leadership affects other areas of the brand and that's exactly what happens here it affects your operations has it affect operations it affects operations because of the low morale and so people are not motivated enough to really put in their best work. So timelines get hit. When timelines get hit, you're not you're not charging money to close deals. You're not charging money on projects that are sitting there and they're not moving efficiently. And then ultimately, the big thing here that we really need to consider is the trust that we build within our culture, within everybody else that we talk to, that we lead, that we interact with. And the solutions here is we got to raise your standards. You got to raise your standards on what you do, who you are, how you get up in the morning, and your standards on how you do business. And I'm going to channel the hip hop side here. You got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You got to check in with yourself. You got to find out what's going on with you. What are the variables that are missing here? What is X? What is that one thing that's missing here? And one of the things that I work with the entrepreneurs and, and thought leaders and anybody who wants to get to the next level personally to take their business to the, to the next level is teaching people how to let go. Let go of the things they can control and focus on the things that do matter. And it's an easy concept, but it's a lot more difficult when put into practice. And that's what I walk you, walk you or my clients through. And it's breaking those limiting beliefs, destroying imposter syndrome, because you're here right now because you are you are good at what you do. And even if you're at year three, there's someone at year one that needs your year three. If you're year five, there's someone at year one, two, three, four that need what you do. You have someone that you can serve. And the other thing with leadership is you've got to give a shit. You actually got to care. And that's one area where you have to have empathy, compassion, understanding, not reacting to things. 
and you got to get physical. You got to move. You got to actually take care of your body itself because physiology is so important to your mental growth and emotional fitness too, because emotional, uh, mental, mental health is a byproduct of mental fitness. Mental fitness is, is connected to your physical fitness as well. So I'm not telling you to go get super fit and get a six pack. I'm telling you to start moving, start doing something to get your body moving. And like I said, razor standards, I put it double here because it's, it really comes down to you're living your life based upon the standards that you've accepted that you deserve that you think that your team deserves or that everyone else in your life deserves. What is What do you deserve? What does everybody else deserve out of you getting to the next level? Find that why and get clear about what you absolutely want in life. Get clear about what your mission is. Your why is, it has to be so strong that you're going to, you're going to, not use the excuse that I'm not motivated today. It's that, you know what? I have something bigger to accomplish and I'm going to get it done. Being certain about that and really understanding yourself. And I have another course that uh, in this deck that talks about really knowing yourself and understanding your emotions. It's the red flags of emotions on understanding what lane you're in and that it's to be in the center lane. Let's do a quick case study here. Leadership as a thought leader, as an expert, Gary Vaynerchuk, if you're not familiar with him, he is a fucking rock star. He is amazing. He's gone publicly saying that he's actually hasn't been able to, to book some or some people don't want to hire him to speak on stage for some things because of how much he swears. But he stays so authentic to that, at risking leaving money on the table, but he's himself and he does more business with people that align with him. One thing with him as a thought leader, as a leadership, is that he makes sure that his message is out there. He puts his message out there through omnipresent marketing. And there's this is, is I would say, a buzzword, but some people are using this inaccurately. And there's actually one company online that uses this inaccurately on saying omnipresent marketing on YouTube. But omnipresent means you're everywhere. You're all over the place. Digital, print, wherever you need to be, but you're everywhere, not just YouTube. Gary Vee does a great job of this, and his team does an amazing job as well, putting himself out there where he needs to be, not where he wants to be. And then he's good at, with the authenticity, it builds trust. It's real. It's that thing that you know that when someone's authentic, you know that they're not hiding something. So they're not hiding who they are. They're not going to hide anything else from you. And so key here, because the key is that you want to do business with people that you want to do business with not people that you have to convince to do business with you, that like how you operate, that know that you're going to get the job done or like your personality or, or or resonate on some level together. We are much more efficient this way when we lead in this manner of authenticity. And it, like I said, raising your standards, four and six, interject here, you know, operate by your own principles. Have your own principles and your principles come from setting new standards for yourself because when you do all this we hit number five you stand out you stand out so differently and that's so absolutely key this is a case study when it comes down to personal brand strategy and creating this image and the biggest thing about being a leader of yourself is when you show up authentic the brand creates itself but you got to do the work but then when you do the work as a brand as a business leading as a brand is different. Now, let's say that you're a chief marketing officer, your CMO, marketing director, and you have to, in some instances, I'll use the phrase, or this instance, I will use the phrase managing up. And that is how do you move the business in a way to where you have to work with the thought leader, or you have to work with the entrepreneur or the CEO who makes all the decisions. Let's get away from that dynamic. But this is why a brand strategy is important because you have to figure out systems and processes on what your brand stands for, not what the individual person wants and believes and how they want to do business because not everyone's like you. Not everyone does business like you just because you're an entrepreneur does not mean everybody else, all the other entrepreneurs think like you. So separate yourself as a brand, as a business and how you're going to lead the market. These three brands here, Disney, Warby Parker, Louis Vuitton, they've all done it in a very different way. Walt Disney was excellent at this and they even powered their employees to solve uh, visitors customer problems equally 
if you're a janitor all the way up to a manager, you're empowered to make that person's day the best you can. And the also the other thing here was Patrick Bet David. I heard this term uh, from him. It's entrepreneur. Not everybody has to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody has to be a thought leader. And you can also make massive impact within an organization by serving on the board, by being one of the VPs, by being someone else in the organization. Because when you shine as a director and you put out there, you are you, it's going to channel through to the rest of the organization. And yes, I understand corporate nuances, but don't let that sway you from you being the best you can be within the organization. And Warby Parker did something different here. They empowered the customer. Not only did they make it easy, what they ended up doing was they took on an entire industry, a monopoly that basically ran the entire eyeglass, sunglass industry, and they changed the game. They made the buying process easy. They gave that power of choice to the customer and made the buying experience super easy. And they changed the game on how people buy sunglasses and eyewear. And then Louis Vuitton sets a standard. You know what to expect because let me ask you this. Have you seen any Louis Vuitton bags for a discount? Have you seen him at a uh, one of those uh, discount malls and things like that? Outlet centers. You're not going to because they have a standard. The standard is that they're going to take everything back at the end of the year and they're going to keep it in house, either destroy it, repurpose it, whatever. I don't know the exact processes, but it's been rumored that they actually burn the, a lot of the material and things they have at the end of the year. That way it doesn't get out there. You have imposters, but they have a certain standard. Their prices are their prices. And they've led the industry by saying, this is the standards of what we give our customers. This is how we operate. And this is what we're going to do. And that's all there is to it. And this is how we lead as a brand, really figuring out what you stand for. If you want to move the needle and create different kind of brand power here. Allocating your energy in finance is, I think, one of the fundamentals that a lot of people get wrong on when they approach finance as a brand. Because there's something I heard recently, and when you lose a phone call, or let's say that your services are down for an hour, and let's say that your service is like you're charging $50 an hour or $100 an hour, you didn't really lose that $50 or $100 an hour or whatever that client acquisition was going to be whatever that client or that customer cost is, what you're really losing $500, $1,000, $10,000 from that one loss of a customer based upon everything else it's costing you. So the cost really is much more exponential to really get clear on what you're doing and understanding how much your customers are worth. Because in brand finance allocation, there's three different lanes, sales, marketing, and brand. And the cost of having this really misaligned is your marketing dollars. You are churning through money, spending marketing in the wrong place. I'm going to take you guys through an actual uh, finance allocation, uh, infographic kind of thing. Uh, my formula that I developed and I created a graphic for it. You're welcome to use it on how to actually allocate and what that actually looks like more in depth, but it's costing you money. Connecting with your audiences. Uh, it's through your messaging. If your messaging is off and you're not using the proper messaging from your brand over to your marketing, it's costing you. And what's happening is you're losing that connection in not investing in the right places to develop the proper key messaging in your marketing and over to your sales. It's costing you money. Your bad conversions, your cost per acquisitions is, it can be expensive. On LinkedIn, recently I heard it was $50 per acquisition of a client and that's expensive you want to be down to one two three dollars at most cases unless you're selling something for like a million dollars obviously it scales but bad leads are also costing you money too what's the solution well one we need to figure out how to allocate this properly and where are you at as a business what's really going on find out also what's working where's the hole in this actual mini silo within this issue here what is working, what isn't working, and then revising the budget. And so what does that look like? Here's the formula. Today, the thing to look at is your sales, marketing, and brand. Short game, short mid game, and long game. Sales, 
if you're dumping all your money into marketing and you're not getting any conversions, conversion point one, do not blame marketing. Why are you not converting? What's going on in sales? So if you have 100% of your, your money in marketing and you're not seeing any results, stop spending 100% of your money budget in marketing. Figure out what's going on in marketing and sales. Why is sales not working? You know, we were running a campaign at the agency and uh, we were driving all this sales, all these leads to this organization. They said, look, we're not getting anything. Come to find out that the sales team wasn't even looking at any of the leads that were coming in. There's actually another case where there was a gentleman, he was actually this chief marketing officer. And in a conversation with him, he said, well, we don't have a brand. Well, let me dispel that immediately. The second you have a you have any exchange of, of money and your reputation is on the line, you have a brand. And in this aspect, this chief marketing officer, we actually took the hit at the agency because they said, well, we've, we've been with you guys six months. We don't have any leads. Come to find out all the leads were actually being held at his desk and they weren't being distributed anywhere else. It's not always marketing. A lot of times it's sales. What's going on there? And if you're if you are really looking to close your doors and you want to keep it from closing, you got to have to have a proper balance between sales and marketing. But then let's say you've been in business for a while, you know, you're churning around a healthy 15 to 20 percent profit annually. And you want to figure out how do you grow that percentage of profit per year, but also build brand equity. Now you're at a good point to where, you know what, you've got money. Marketing is running smooth. Sales is going well. Now, how can we dial it in even more? How can we make marketing do a better job? How can we make sales give them the empowerment they need while we build brand equity? And so we now work on new key messaging. We start retooling this. This is a constant thing. Where are you at right now and where is the goal? Where do you need to be? This comes down to doing a little bit more of a review. So this is the financial allocation audit that really helps you dial in a little bit more. I want to get you guys to that 11. And then 11 leads us to the little things that really help you grow. Operations. Operations usually comes across to many people in a business as kind of just the SOPs and the standard stuff that you're thinking about. And yeah, to a certain degree, but it's the little things. So let me ask you this. If I gave you the phone and it says, hey, Comcast is on the line for you. And I need you to, to handle this. What emotion did you just feel versus I want you now, let's go with the positive. I want you to think about the best customer interaction you've ever had. What's the best restaurant experience? What's the best store purchasing experience you've ever had? Now weigh both of those out. That for me is the little things in operations on how brand operations is actually built. So we're looking at scaling. Like I said, Standard operating procedures help you build more value and automate. And then we've got speed, quality to quantity. So many times people want to be in a rush. They want to just push through things. What really we need to definitely slow down a little bit. And the brand operations allows us to be a little more flexible. And dialing in more to the SOPs is within every single one of those boring operating procedures, how can we now include the brand experience? How can we make the day when the fella, you, you bring you bring something nice home for your partner, for your wife, whoever it is. I'm not arguing genders here. Whatever your preference is, it's not like that. Just go with this. It's the little things that someone else does for you that you don't have to ask for that makes it just that much better. That is brand operating experience right there because the cost of alignment here, the cost of the, the cost here is really simple math of not having brand operations in place. You got bottlenecks. Why do we have bottlenecks? Because of leadership. What is that costing us in time and money, conversions, everything? And then the efficiency comes from that as well, is that if we're not operating as efficient as possible from time to money, it's costing you. And that varies based upon what your business model is, what that looks like. And then let's go 10,000 feet. Let's go exit strategy here. How much of the market share are you losing every single phone call? 
how much market share are you losing based upon those bad experiences? Or did you get a, a great, give someone a great experience and now they that one customer has created five more customers for you. Now you've taken more market share from your, your, your competitor. And the solutions here to find X, answer X is creating new operating systems, new standards, standard operating procedures. And EOS is actually, I'm not a certified EOS implementer and I'm not a, a, an affiliate of them, but EOS, the executive operating system is a great place to start if you don't have anything in place, but it's also a great framework for you in your own personal life, your own development or uh, a business that you run from small, medium or large business. And then the other things that you want to do is automate as much as you possibly can, outsource where you can, and play the infinite game here. What does the infinite game look like in brand operations? What it looks like is that you are looking for things that KPIs cannot answer. And that is the little things. How are you doing more that is not a simple quantifiable metrics, but a qualitative metric? And what does that mean for your business? The infinite game is injecting more quality and raising your standards as we have overlap once again. And then we get to the, the operating strategy, the operating Bible, brand strategy. And I wish more organizations would really take brand strategy seriously from personal brand strategy to business brand strategy because that helps you get to performance branding to really dial in even more. Because everything that happens here in brand strategy affects everything. It affects everything that you do from business, operations, leadership, marketing, sales. There's a cost to not having a proper strategy in place. But the brand strategy, typically standard across the industry, answers why, what, and who. Rarely will it answer how, because the marketing strategy is the, kind of the, the marketing strategy, is the delivery system. But it's important also to answer at a high level, how? How do we want people to engage? How do we want this to happen? What is the sales funnel? What does that look like? What's our landing page look like? What's our what's our user experience look like? So that's the how in this component. M the majority of, of, of brand strategies that I've seen does not have this component. And this is one variable that's missing because the cost of not having your brand strategy in place is that it's costing every silo that you have from your business, financial leadership, your operations, marketing sales, it's costing you everything. And now if you wanna know what that looks like, add up where it's being impacted across the board and then add all those up and that's X. That's the amount of money, of opportunity that you could actually, in this instance here, our brand strategy would help you tweak and refine what you're doing. And I'm not saying dumping more money in the marketing, keep the budget the same, not dumping more money in any area, but dialing in a little bit more to figure out, hey, how can we improve each one of these categories as a, as a kind of reset? And then you move on from there to do more because the X here, the, the solution that we're looking for here is you gotta have a strategy. Take care of your brand basics which include your marketing messaging and key messaging and the, the look that you have and how you engage, how you communicate with your audience. And then living your brand is that you have to, at every given point, it's that, yeah, you might not want to go to the gym, might not feel like it, but what does that say about you? You have to live by the convictions of yourself because that represents you, your brand, do what you say. And your your organization is that you have to live by this model. Every every silo has to live by this brand strategy, this Bible. And you have to educate internally. So if you're going to do a brand rollout, it's making sure that everybody's always on the same page. They know what the vision is. And if it's and if you've done the work and leadership and hire the right culture, educating is really aligning people under the same value points that you have for yourself and the business. And the key here is always to be transparent. Brand strategy encompasses that authenticity because what we're doing is we're taking the personality of you, yourself, 
as a thought leader, as an expert, as an entrepreneur, as the leader, dialing in there, but then also dialing in a little bit more and taking all of the stuff that is is at the core of what you are and who you stand for, what you what you stand for, and being very transparent about that and being unapologetic about it as well and having those boundaries. So a quick case study here is I'm going to talk about Lacosta. Lacosta is, he was a French tennis player. This is not him. This is just a representation of the brand because there's the shirt here. And it's interesting because what he did was because there was no real new category, he was the first to the industry in a very specific way. The company had gone from this prestige brand to near death. And let me walk you through that. So Lacosta was, he was actually the son of a wealth, wealthy uh, family in France. And what he really wanted to do was play tennis. That's what he really wanted to do. He was an underdog, but he was a small guy. And what he ended up doing through his, through his aggressive, just passion to push forward was that there was actually one day a fan, uh, I think it was a fan or a friend ended up drawing him a little, little logo. And so let's talk about the logo really quick. The logo, the, the crocodile. It has two meanings to it. Because when Lacosta was actually, when he went through and he, he practiced and he became a became this guy that they invited to all these tournaments, he was walking one day and he passed this ex, this expensive briefcase. It was made out of crocodile. or um, Yeah, crocodile. And so also he got the nickname the crocodile because of how he played tennis as well. But it was actually the first time in history that the actual logo was put on the outside of a garment. He actually showed up with this garment. He actually got made fun of because of this, but other brands and other tennis players, because in tennis polos and comfortable was, was not the norm. You actually ended up wearing clothes that were kind of stifling and they were just, it was too much like with the full sleeves and the pants. So he changed it. So he started showing up and he became this kind of rebellious image within tennis. And then all the other tennis players were like, I want to do that too. They want to be more comfortable and play. He actually got upset about it. And he he then actually set a precedence for everybody else in the industry to start doing some of these things differently. Lacosta was the first brand to put the icon up there. Not, not Polo, not any of the other ones. Lacosta was. And Lacosta really did it, actually believed in never spending money on advertising. It was all brand. He says, if you create something so good, you don't have to advertise. And in this instance, he was right, but it was also a different time frame, different industry on how things work. But he believed the power of brand. And for him, it wasn't pushing marketing to get leads because it was kind of a side product, but he used his own personal brand and his own beliefs and embody that in the actual brand. But what killed the brand in the 90s? Walmart. So when the company actually wanted to scale and start making more money, they made the horrible decision to feature La Costa brand in Walmart, all places, killing the just the prestige of this brand. And it went from this, this amazing thing and this icon, and now it's just in Walmart. And so... They pulled it back, and the new creative director from I see, I think uh, Yves Saint Laurent actually came over and revitalized it into a new space, and that came down to new leadership from the leadership from the original from Lacosta himself all the way to the new creative director that came in and revitalized it. There was new blood, new leadership, new direction, and with that, revitalized this. And it's so important to do that within an organization because then it injects into the culture because the thing, the rule that I have with culture is that if you don't build your culture, someone else will. Usually it's not good. Usually it's someone else who, who is disgruntled and there's no value points. So they come up with things for themselves and how they want to actually complain. And, and it just, it gets messy guys. It really gets messy. So when replacing, this is this is some data points. I didn't create the data points when replacing, because the key here is to save money and make money. It can cost 
50% of an employee's salary, upwards of 150% to replace them for many reasons. One, not specifically training, but training is one of them, but also that time it takes to ramp up that curve to get them back up to speed, lost business. You know, there's a lot of components here just due to a poor culture kills your attrition rate. And why we want to inject really good culture aside from mitigating the attrition rate, spending money and losing money there is that when we really invest in the culture and creating an environment, that's key here, creating an environment to foster growth, we've now created brand ambassadors, people that are willing to champion the brand. And when we do this with external culture, we set our own brand value, then we can actually be an icon for everybody else, whether it be Nike, Adidas, or somebody else, then those people buying that brand says, hey, this says something about me. Just like when Steve Jobs came back to Apple and he changed it and it says, the people that buy these products, the brand says something about them. There's a great video on this by Simon Sinek, one of my idols. And if if you look up The Golden Circle by Simon Sinek, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. He talks about this. And this is what I'm talking about here. External culture, brand loyalty, why people buy, and having them constantly come back because that that's so key here. Having people selling for you. And that right there, as a personal brand, it's having people sell for you. Personal brand is passive lead generation. And when we can do this inside the culture, when we start with ourselves as a personal brand, then we create more, more people that are going to push the brand for us as well from an internal, external as well. And then in California, I know it's huge to buy bean bags and Capri Suns and buy juice bars and give people things, objects, items. That's not, that's not culture. That's not culture building. That's not environment building. That is creating stuff because then at that moment you've created a new, new framework for golden handcuffs to keep people there at the office. And eventually they're going to look for purpose in their life. And what really drives people and keeps them motivated is that they're doing something that they feel is of value, not hiring people by CV, but finding people that actually share the same vision to go to that next level with you. And also the big thing with contribution with culture is contribution, building those relationships inside your organization and, and doing everything you can to foster and be the leader that actually that serves. And like I said before, it's about caring, caring about your employees, caring about the people you work with, caring about the impact that you make. And when we don't do these things, two major areas is that when we have bad culture, we have attrition rates that are through the roof. And I just shared the numbers on that. And it differs because of how big your organization is. And sometimes that's a, that's a big hit. I know that uh, from a city standpoint, the city of Jacksonville actually loses millions of dollars every single year because of the training that they have with certain positions within the city itself because of poor, poor culture, toxic culture is killing so much and costing taxpayers millions of dollars. And then your customers, they have a poor experience then that's going to spread. And when you have a strong culture behind people that are brand advocates that love everything about your brand, they're going to reinforce that. It's like, hey, you know what? I had a great experience with that with that company. And that's the thing here is that when we're talking sales, as we overlap here for culture and sales, when we have strong, strong experiences, is that when that customer comes back for the second purchase now they're your customer not that first sale the key is like they bought it but how do you keep them coming back buying more products from you a second time third time because they do that then your your value on that customer increases from that one time buy to the lifetime of that customer how much can that customer be of worth over five years and how do you foster that relationship in a case study here for, for Supreme, Supreme started out as a, a skateboard brand and it took them, I think, about 10 years before they started blowing up. And they had a subculture. They had a way they did business. And there was this, this kind of 
attitude that you had and this exclusivity. And I'm not going to say black market, gray market, maybe, because with a limited run, when they release merchandise, let's say they release only 500 pieces, those shirts that might have been $50 or $100, now we're selling for $500 on the gray market after sale. Now, Supreme didn't make any money there. But what they did is they created this, this need of what that meant. And that meant that it represented that subculture outside of the business in a different way. And it became this community, this place that you can go to a sneakerhead event and you'd find Supreme uh, that was marked up beyond all kinds of different ways. And the way that they did business was there were, there were I've read articles about how Supreme would actually create these designs, but they were so close to lawsuit uh, risk that the companies would actually end up suing them because they would create these designs that were resemblance of something that was already out there. And so likeness rights and things like that. And, but they were sold out of the merchandise so quickly, this created more value within the organization because of the cultures on how you actually position the model of the business. And now you see all the way from the positioning of the model on how they operated, the, the brand experience and pricing, all that has now come to the point to where Supreme is a humble skate brand was sold for $2 billion to Louis Vuitton at the end of the day. Then we get into conversion points. Person, conversion point one, marketing. Marketing gets such a bad rap for two reasons. One, most people put too much faith and too much emphasis on marketing, but not really understanding it to a full depth. But then you also have marketing agencies out there that are doing more than just marketing. And they're, they're kind of flubbing it in some ways. Now, I'm not attacking anybody in a negative way, but I'm calling it how I see it and what it really is. You've got shitty companies out there that are really just taking money. And there's actually some case studies where some organizations in marketing are actually going out there and driving up lead generation for three months. But then after that, leads dry up for that organization. But as a business, those marketing agencies are actually using money from, from other campaigns to to churn and drive sales. So it's taking from robbing from Peter to pay Paul in that instance there on their operating model. And those businesses shut down. And then you have a bad impression on marketing as a business on what's going on there. And there's ways to really understand marketing on a whole other level and, and bad marketing, bad marketing data costs so much money on the wrong data being utilized in the wrong ways. And if it's costing an average of $14 million a year for medium to large businesses, what's it costing you from a personal level, your time, your energy, your money. But then as a small business, if your profit margin is only at 10 to 15%, it's costing you a lot. And it's, it's important to understand what's really, what's really going to drive your campaigns because there's, there's this idea out here that these buzzwords that I keep seeing thrown around, I want you guys to understand that it, it, the buzzwords are they're great to a certain extent because red ocean, blue ocean, when used properly, it's understanding that there was a book that was written that talked about red ocean, blue ocean. And I want to protect you guys or educate you and, and empower you rather with proper information when you see someone out there on YouTube talking about these buzzwords of, Red Ocean, Omni, I want you guys to have the right information. So Red Ocean is basically, you're in the 10% of the markets ready to buy right now. And a lot of people are dumping a lot of marketing dollars into that area and you're chumming up the waters. But what really sets you apart, that authentic part of you as a person, as a thought leader, as a business, is your blue ocean. You're in your own lane and no one can compete with you because you do what you do and you do what you do best. And that's being you. And 30% of the people out there that are looking to buy are going to buy in the next 90 days. They're going to buy in the next 90 days. And the scale from 30 to 60% here, it, it alternates a little bit. It fluctuates, but this is the average. And then 60% are lost. So the 30% is so important because that's where you build the relationships. That's where you can take people and be like, hey, you know what? You're looking. Now let's hit them with some retargeting. Let's give them some more value. 
And let's build that trust with them in this cycle of 90 days, being ourselves and connecting with them. And as a conversion point here, as conversion point number one, the way that we, that's so essential today to do marketing is omnipresent marketing. It's not a term that I coined. It's a, a term that's a, being widely used across the industry. Omnipresent marketing is making sure that you're seen. Because if you're not in front of somebody, no one's going to know that you exist. And it has to come down to consistency. You need to be seen consistently across the board in the places that matter to you. I'm not talking about five social media channels. I'm talking about what works. If you, what works for you is two social media channels, dial in and figure out what works for you, what strategy works based upon the proper data points. You got to be everywhere. You got to be everywhere. You got to be seen. But the thing here also, when you embrace authenticity and you're pushing out there, marketing is testing. That's all marketing is. Do not put all your baskets in, in one thing. It's positioning yourself for feedback. Look at marketing as feedback. When you approach marketing more as a scientist to look for, hey, we tried this, it didn't work. We tried that, it didn't work. We tried this, it worked. Let's switch the formula. Always expect pushback from things that don't work. You're not going to have 100% ROI on every dollar that's going out. It's a long game. This is why marketing is not a short game. Marketing is a short to mid game because it takes time. It takes 90 days on average for the people that you really want to target. And then, like I said, marketing is testing. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it because the cost of, of misalignment here is the conversion point. The conversion loss, cost per acquisition of a customer. You know, if you don't have the proper data and you're going just based upon impulsive, like, hey, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try this. Without really thinking this through, this is why as a solution, the variables that matter here is that you have to slow down. You have to have a strategy, figure out what you're doing, have a direction, get everyone on the same page and be ready to pivot based upon the data. So a quick, quick uh, instance here is when we talk Google Analytics, there was actually a meeting we were in one day and we're sitting there with a the client and we're looking at the analytics and we switched over four different pages and we switched traffic over to four new landing pages, specifically user experience uh, designed to get conversion. It was conversion optimized. And as we're looking at the analytics, all the customers saw in one category was that they were down 200% but that was a good thing because that negative 200% was a positive on the other landing pages. So it was key to understand the data, know why the data is there and really understand what matters for your business based upon every single decision. Have to have someone who actually knows how to read this and be ready to pivot. Like I said, there is no flaming sword of justice in marketing. It's testing, it's science, it's variables, it's weighing out everything. Having something, going back and going back to the brand strategy, retooling it, going back to if something changes in the industry, going back, retooling it. If there's a market shift, retooling it, always be ready to move. Let's talk about Go Silo. It's that little place right between marketing and sales. And I love this because marketing and sales is like a marriage. It's like a relationship. And you guys can get angry at each other. Sales blames marketing. Marketing blames sales. This is why having a positive emotional direction is important here. And having good leadership in place is so vital. Because when we do that, we're able to take all the emotions out of this and really look at the right data points to figure out what is really going on between these two. Because sales is conversion point number two. What's going on in sales? And according to some estimates, Bad sales hires cost an organization 50 to 75% of the highest annual salary. But what are they costing you from not converting the sale? And there's a, a case study that I'm going to share with you a little bit more about that one, but immediately stop blaming marketing for all the problems of why you're not doing something. And I know a lot of people hate sales, but you got to learn to love it. And there's there's a rule in sales that I, I heard from uh, one of my consultants. And he was telling me is that there's a rule of six feet. Be ready 
to start with absolute unabashed conviction of talking about what you're selling, be ready to, to, to sell from a place of not selling, but knowing that what you have to give, really, you believe in what you're quote unquote selling because you know that the value it's going to bring to the person that someone out there is going to need it, that you're bringing them some serious value. That's what it is. And that's what you're doing. That's what sales is. If you believe in it, then they're going to believe that you believe in it. That's what they really want. And it's about building those relationships, about really fostering more of that relationship here. And Christian Abraham said, as he was doing a sales training with me, he said, when value exceeds price, people buy. In sales, that's not about right there getting the hard point. It's about getting everything else out of the way and finding out what, what is it that they really value. Because the cost of misalignment here is productivity, you know, bad sales training and training it's bad productivity training um, brand experience because if they have a, a bad experience on the phone then that means that you're lost the customer and then you've got to go back and you got to train that person to do it right and then that's a loss in productivity there's some people that i've heard on the phones that take forever to actually make a sale so how can we streamline this and really get down to it to having a proper sales strategy to make the most out of it so I want to talk about a, 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 an experience that I had one day. So I'm in Kohl's and I go in there and it's the middle of the day and there's just one guy in front of me and he, I, I walk up mid sale and they're ringing him up and he was like, no, I don't want it. I don't, I don't want this. I don't want that. I just want to pay for this and get out of the store. And I'm like, whoa, it's got this guy bother. And I, I in a moment, I kind of felt bad for them to kind of deal with this and, as he's walking away, they said to him, "It's like, hey, you have cold cast. Did you want this? And he goes, no, stop trying to sell me something. Let me get out of the store. And he was already past the register. And I was like, wow. And then I get up there. And I kid you not, I understood exactly why he felt the way he did in 30 seconds. Because throughout that buying experience, that sale, I got hit with probably, I think, seven or eight questions as I'm trying to check out. And how many questions can there really be? And this right here comes down to who thought this was a good idea to constantly berate the customer with question after question after question. It becomes irritating. And with a proper brand strategy, you can mitigate these things. And the key here, like I said, Fall in love with sales, not sales itself, but fall in love with what you do and the solution you're offering. And the solutions here is be ready to sell. Believe in what you're selling. Train. Really, really train. Get in there. Get involved. Fail. Test out. And if you need to, outsource the work. If you're not an expert at sales, you don't have to be. Your job as, as an entrepreneur, as a thought leader, as any of those, is not your job to be the salesperson to outsource that work or or uh give that work to someone else you know and the thing here is you got to build relationships give give value give 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 don't always take and the thing here is you got to make it painless through proper brand strategy and operations is that we got to make the the process painless and don't be afraid to invest in this area like i said brand allocation some people think that they're just going to bring in someone from sales and that because they've done sales at another organization, that they're going to go ahead and pick it up and start selling. Have proper training in your sales if you want to make the most out of it. Because if you don't, you're going to burn money in, in both sales and marketing alone. Case study here is that there was a, a situation where we were working with a client and we had did a rebrand with them. And we built them a brand new website. They've been around for a long time. It's a, a second or third generation family. A great business, great name already. But there was a lot of things that were keeping them from growing. And we started with not a full rebrand, but kind of some positioning and really figure out how to like fine tune them a little bit more. And we started with a website. So we built them a brand new website that was conversion optimized. Immediately within weeks, they saw a jump in percentage of conversion and new leads. But then 
we now face new problems going into this. And this is why it's so important to ask a lot of the questions up front. So what were the problems? Leadership was an issue. So the personal issues that one of the owners had was actually hindering the culture and it was blocking progress in many areas of the business. And so work had to be done one-on-one -on -one coaching that particular partner to help them find new life and new blood, which actually then became a better place for the entire staff. And then we get down to the sales part. Come to find out, as we dug a little deeper, we find out what, what's going on here. We've got all these leads coming in, but they're saying that the leads aren't, aren't good. And the staff, the one sales guy that they had, they had one sales guy. He was making, I believe, about maybe $120,000 to $140,000 a year comfortably easy. What we found out was that he was comfortable with that life and that, and that amount of money he was making. But he was leaving a $1.2 million on the table because he was comfortable. They weren't bad leads. They were good. So we brought in new staff. We did training. We didn't get rid of him. We we set new standards and new new structure, new operating procedures around that sales staff and how they do it and how how we now introduce that brand. And we brought in new staff there. And when we did that, we were able to in six months get back that million dollars. We were like we were able to take that company from where they were at, leaving the one point two on the table, to getting that million dollars six months later. This is the benefit from really coming in and measuring everything and finding out what's really going on. And the key here is don't get stuck in how you think it should be because that really cripples your business in so many ways. And it's always important to understand that this isn't black and white. Things move, they adapt. Understanding the data, knowing where to use it, how to use it, what, what department the data needs to go to and weighing out all those variables, taking your emotions out of everything and really figuring out, say, hey, what's the problem here? Let's dial in. Let's get to 11. And let's find out how we cannot lose money. But now we can get to an even keel of making sure we're not losing all this money of our revenue and our bottom line and figuring out how much time can we save. And the important thing here is, Really, don't chase the data as as a simple as a simple rule. So many times people get caught up in the data. Understand the data, use it as one of the tools in your belt, not the tool, because data itself is cold. And then you got to find the right data points that work for you, where where you're going and what's going to matter for your scale. It's not the same for everybody, and that's the thing is that your competitor is doing something based upon their goals. It's important to find the right data points that work for you and your goals. And again, I reiterate, it's not black and white. Understand that there's uh, there's something always going on, and it's important to find out what that is. And I love solving complex problems, and this is one of them. And then go back and tweak the strategy. Because at the end of the day, brand equity is determined by your customers, not you. And so that wraps that section. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to break these sections up because we got the three advertising types next. And that's millennial, traditional, progressive. I'm going to go ahead and keep recording here, but I'm going to go ahead and stop and have that master class there. I would love to get your, your insight if you have any questions that I might be able to answer for you. And I'd like to keep the conversation going and, and see how this has helped you kind of restructure the way that your perspective is on how you do business and how you lead and how your organization is moving the needle to get to that exit strategy. So come back as I continue on here for the millennial, traditional, and progressive three advertising types. And I'll see you guys soon.